So in fifth grade, I found a book that I'll never forget. It was called How to Do Nothing with No One All Alone by Yourself. Interesting title, right? So basically, it's this encyclopedia of old-fashioned activities uh, the kids have been doing for thousands of years, hundreds of years. Ever heard of the game Mongoli Cut, where you try to flip a pocket knife off your hand in all these different ways and make it land in the dirt? It's not, it's not as dangerous as it seems. It's not that bad. Or have you ever thought about how to make any paper airplane do loops and turns just by modifying it a little bit? That is the kind of thing this book talks all about. And it has all these different activities from different cultures, but they're united all by one thing. The TV and video games are nowhere in sight. And in fact, one of the stated missions of the book is actually to liberate kids from video games and TV for a few hours and introduce them to real things, fascinating things. I love that book. So I found this book at a time in my life, in fifth grade, when I still played video games pretty often. I, I certainly would call myself an addict, but it was more often than I consider ideal now, for sure. And I thought I was totally satisfied. I thought I was having a lot of fun with the video games. So naturally, I was a little surprised when I realized how much I was actually enjoying these alternative activities out of the book that were hundreds of years old. I started doing them more and more, and eventually they started taking up some of my video game time. I was okay with that. They started competing for my time now. I was really enjoying these activities. At the time, I couldn't quite place my finger on what I liked about them so much. But I knew I liked them. I wasn't sure, but I liked them. So I was moving away from video games. And I made this observation. I hadn't noticed, noticed this before. I started seeing kids everywhere I went playing video games. And it struck me as zombie-ish. So when you think of a little kid, the stereotype is energetic, running around, active, like exploring everything with curiosity. But seeing a kid looking at a phone, just staring obsessively into it, at a device that's specifically designed to keep them staring as long as possible? It was freaky, I thought. So obviously these observations caused me to move away from video games more and more. And not playing video games is one thing when I'm entertaining myself at home. But it's a whole new thing when I'm at friends' houses and they want to play. I distinctly remember, I was at a hanging out with a couple friends once, and we were talking about what to do for the day. So somebody brought up playing some Super Mario Bros or watching TV, and I naturally brought up going to the skate park or biking around a little. So we began our little debate about what to do. And to my dismay, we seemed to be leaning towards video games. I didn't know what else to do. I really didn't want to play video games. So I just say, point blank, you know guys, I just don't like video games very much. That is not the kind of thing you usually say to a fifth grade group of friends. So they looked at me like I was from another planet and said, well, what do you do then? What do you do instead? And I start talking about mumbly peg, and they don't know what mumbly peg is, so I explain it to them, and paper airplanes and stuff. And they watch me with this kind of confused fascination, like they're wondering what insanity provokes me to do this stuff. Um, then the same kid asks me, well, do your parents support it? Like, what are, your, are your teachers OK with it? What do they think? <laughs> this is just too countercultural. And I say, oh, yeah, of course they support it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the same kid, he just stares at me for a second. And he says, you are being abused. <laughs> so I thought about that conversation for a long time afterwards. It has still stuck with me. It really brought open my eyes to how weird and countercultural it was for a fifth grader not to play video games. It, I thought they were missing out. It also opened my eyes to how hard it often was to get my fifth grade friends not to play video games as well. I got frustrated. I wanted to do this stuff with my friends and share it. A lot of them were unwilling. So I had this crazy, crazy countercultural idea, a method of civil, a civil disobedience that would allow me to live out my frustration productively. So the week before I turned 11, I spontaneously said to my mom, Mommy, I am rebelling. And she replied with an open-minded, OK, what are you rebelling against? And I said, I am refusing to play video games. So I proceeded to just run in the house and unplug my Wii, put my DS in its bag, put them in the closet, shut the door, and they have pretty much remained there today. So that was one of the most profound decisions of my life. And I learned a couple really interesting things from doing that. For one thing, I got more time to pursue the activities I was interested in, which is an obvious consequence. I drew more, I skateboarded more, I played more music. 
But the bigger thing, remember how I was talking about how I liked the alternative activities earlier, but I wasn't quite sure why? Quitting video games completely, just taking them out of my life, really gave me insight onto what exactly I liked. So time changed when I wasn't playing video games. What it was like when I was playing video games, I remember. I would be playing, and I would intend to look at the clock every couple minutes. And I'd look at it every what felt like a couple minutes, and it would be a few hours. And it felt like when I was playing video games, I was holding this ball of sand, and it was just slipping through my fingers uncontrollably. It was the time just slipping away. I couldn't control it, and it was not passing, not passing well. When you think of time passing, time flying, it has a positive connotation to it. This was not positive. It was like desperation. And then the bigger thing is, when I looked back on the time I spent playing video games, it felt wasted. It felt like I hadn't used it well. In contrast, with these real-world activities, time felt richer. It felt like every moment, every second was full of possibility and joy. And it wasn't necessarily that time felt slower. It just seemed to pass more deeply. And it was almost like, instead of the ball of sand falling through, it just kind of levitated. It was just there. And it was there. And when I stopped playing, it would just fall to the ground. But it wasn't slipping uncontrollably. And when I looked back on my real world activities, like drawing and stuff, I would feel that I had improved myself in the process and that I had used my time well. So this is the kind of state of flow I think real world activities can bring about if you enjoy them. So when I, when I identified this precisely, I became almost obsessed with trying to get to this state of flow in any way possible. I was doing all these other activities, trying to find new ones. So conveniently, one of my friends, a couple of days later, brought his yo-yo into school. So we were fifth graders, and um, naturally, we found it very interesting to have a new kind of toy at school. When he brought his yo-yo in, he could only do two tricks. He could do the Eiffel Tower, and he could do, uh, oh, sometimes, <laughs> rock the baby. We loved it. It instantly became a fad. And within the rest of the day, a good dozen kids could do the basic sleeper and get it back to their hands. So being fifth graders, we got, we, all of us got yo-yos. Not all of us, but many of us got yo-yos in a couple days. And what we do during recess, we get in this big circle and practice our tricks together and teach each other new tricks. And I was just amazed at the comradeship and connection that can form around this tiny little simple object. It was incredible to me. I was also amazed at how much better we were getting just through that consistent practice. So the community and the practice really created incredible things. And I still yo-yo a lot today. It's still one of my major alternatives to video games. And I have witnessed firsthand how much fun it can be for myself and others. <laughs> so what's more fun? Those are video games, right? So, um, <laughs> so. so I'm not calling for everyone to quit, quit video games cold turkey. I'm just calling for a balance. Video games can have their place, but this balance is evidently not always present in American culture. Recent national surveys show that the average kid between the ages of 8 and 11 play, uses media, social media, video games, TV, all that combined, for an average about, of about nine hours a day, not including school. Nine hours. Balance is key, but it is not present. We need balance. Real world activities need a bigger place. I also don't want to put down technology. Technology is incredibly powerful. Almost every single yo-yo trick I know, I learned off technology. I wish I could claim to inventing Mach 5, but I learned this off YouTube. Anyone can learn things like this. Not only yo-yoing, anything you're interested in. There's an infinite list of alternative activities you can do. And the internet, and the internet gives us the power to access these. The internet also gives us the power to become addicted. It's incredibly tempting. And many sites, like social media sites, are specifically designed to get us to play and use social media more and more and more. The choice lies with us. We have profound choices here. We can choose the real world, or we can choose addiction. We must choose balance. So besides the flow that I talked about earlier, the sand floating and everything, I think there are some other really compelling reasons to give real world activities a significant place in your life. Firstly, I believe there are fundamentally different kinds of fun. There's the kind of fun you have in video games, which is a very hedonic, uh, pleasure-filled fun. And it's brought about by very specific measured checkpoints of the developer. They want you to walk down a very specific path. 
feeling very specific emotions, being rewarded at very specific times to get you to play more and more. When you think about it, it's really not your own path. It might give the illusion of self-fulfillment and development, but in truth, you're simply walking down the path the developers created and feeling the emotions the developer wants you to feel. So this kind of passive receptivity is not necessarily destructive if done in moderation. Again, nine hours is not moderation. So in contrast, with a real world activity like yo-yoing, as you're doing something like learning a trick, you're following your own path. And as you practice each move, each time you experience your own thoughts, you're going down your own path. And when you finally get it, you're feeling your own feeling of success and accomplishment. You've truly accomplished something within yourself, not simply accomplished something somebody else has already set with a definitive goal in mind. Secondly, real world activities can promote an incredible sense of community. The yo-yo circle thing is very real, and it's obviously not just with yo-yoing. It's with any good real world activity. Real world activities, people, can, people who are passionate around them can connect, and it, they can connect in incredible ways. You might argue that video games are a connection, and to a certain extent, that is true. But it's inarguable that communicating through a chat room at 2 AM is not the same as meeting around passion and improving together. We are only on this earth once. How do you want to live your life? Do you want to live life going down a specific, a specific path that's predestined to end in addictive success? Or do you want to blaze your own trail, learn your own things, have your own thoughts, experience your own emotions and life? The internet makes either of these options more possible than ever before. The choice lies with us. We must use technology and the real world in tandem to create a better lives for ourselves and others. Again, the choice lies with you. How will you use it? I strongly encourage all of you to consider the real world and your decisions. It's truly amazing. Thank you.